So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back, and welcome back for the final session of our meeting. Um, those of you that were here last year will realize that we tried to introduce a, a sort of a slot at the end where we heard from some of the senior leadership in the collaboration, but we also had some challenges as well. So last year, Mark and David Tovey spoke next to uh, Ben Goldacre. And I wanted to keep that sort of evolving new tradition, if you like, of having something at the end of the meeting when we both hear something from the senior leadership, but also we're perhaps challenged and our thinking is sort of uh, shaken up. And we, we just give them the opportunity to think in a, perhaps a, a different way. So I'm actually going to hand over pretty quickly to, to Mark Wilson, who's going to just both talk to us very briefly, but then is going to introduce our final speaker and perhaps explain a little bit about why BJ's come to speak to us today. Mark, thank you. Thank you very much, and good, good to see you all again. Thanks for having me back. And um, where we, uh, uh, what, what's, um, what I'm here to do is, first of all, to remind us where we've come in the last year. A year ago, we were beginning our thinking about um, what the future strategy of Cochrane should be. And as you know, we've now completed that task, established and confirmed uh, a strategy. Um, and I want to take you through uh, a few aspects of it. Obviously, some of them have been introduced in the last um, uh, in, in the last day or so. Uh, but particularly focusing on how we're going to be communicating um, our story, uh, our products, and building our profile in in the world. So, strategy to 2020 is now established. I do hope all of you know about the uh, the strategy page on the community web website. Please go there. You'll find all kinds of resources that will tell you more about it, that will tell you about our targets for this year and next, um, and give you a real grounding in where we're going and what we're doing and why. Effectively, this is our new mission. And I want to highlight it to you this afternoon, particularly in relation to the first line and a half. Our mission is to promote evidence-informed health decision-making. That's what we're about as an organization. In relation to our strap line, therefore, we're producing trusted evidence to ensure that informed decisions are made on health and healthcare around the world, leading to better health for patients everywhere. That's what we're about. Goal one as you've been discussing uh, in the last 24 hours, is around producing evidence. And our production challenge is fundamentally to deliver evidence more quickly and effectively without compromising on quality. I'm whizzing through these because, uh, you know, you can go have a look at it. But I wanted to pick up on the, on the challenge from yesterday. Um, could we be, are we be, are we going to become, should we be a broader church? We're already committed to it in relation to, uh, to Tricia's um, uh, challenge to us. Um, objective five of our new strategy says in, in italics, we will continue to develop innovative methods for designing and conducting research evidence synthesis that help us achieve our mission. And we're already started on that with a target this year in relation to how we're going to do it. We've been spending a lot of time on, on useful, usable, and so on. And that is because as an organization, we are laser-like in our focus on the, the, the reality, the truth, that what we, that what we do only has value to the extent that it's meaningful to people making decisions about health. That's the nub of, of, of what we're about in our new strategy. Goal four, which we haven't talked very much about, and I, and I won't be this afternoon, is recognizing that we also have a road to run in relation to becoming an organization that can deliver this ambitious strategy. We want to be inclusive and open, global and diverse, financially strong, and that's a real challenge with the, with the threat, of, the threat and, the, and the opportunities of open access. We want to be efficiently run. We want to be investing in you um, and, and uh, all our collaborators around the world. We want to be transparently governed and environmentally sustainable as an organization. But this afternoon, we're focusing on very much around goal three, where we've said that we want to make Cochrane the home of evidence to inform health decision making, back to our mission to build greater recognition of our work and to become the leading advocate for evidence-informed health care. That's what we want to do and to be in relation to who we are and how we project ourselves in the world. We want to build our global profile. 
We want to become the home of evidence by becoming a global advocate, a global partner to others, reaching out and recognizing that Cochrane cannot do all that it wants to do on its own. And through all of that, we want to be able to show and prove our global impact. We want to engage with the world in a way that is transformative, that is working more in partnership with others and using our position to speak out for our goals. Our targets for 2014 in this area are first to create a coherent brand across all our content, Cochrane Worldwide, to deepen our existing partnerships, to uh, develop the beginnings of an advocacy and thought leadership agenda so that we have a few positions of which all trials is, is, is one in which we are saying this is Cochrane's view, this is the change we want to see in the world in this area. And as I've said, we want to capture and begin to capture and communicate uh, impact uh, stories and data of our, of our impact. And stories is an important operative word here, not just data, real stories about the change that's been made. So for the rest of my time, I'm going to be focusing on global profile. We will clarify, simplify, and improve the way we communicate to the world by creating an overarching Cochrane brand. That's our first objective in Strategy 2020 Goal 3. Brand is based on perception. So to understand where we want to go to, we have to understand where we are um, already. So what we did at the start of this year is to go out and, um, and uh, basically uh, do a survey um, across seven countries with a, a multiplicity of institutions within the, the, those countries to find out what people thought of Cochrane, of us. And it's important to say that all that I'm going to show you now, and this whole presentation is in much greater detail on the Cochrane Community website in the branding section. So please, I urge you to go and have a look. There's lots of thought-provoking stuff in there. I'm just going to show you a few nuggets about it. Um, but these are the perceptions of those we asked. They may not be true. You may sit there and disagree violently with what you see on the screen. That's not the point. We have to recognize and engage that this is what people think about us, and we have to deal with that as it comes. So they were where the stakeholders came from. And this is what they told us, that the typical Cochrane persona is somebody who's passionate but seen better days. You'll note still very much a kind of British heart, a UK focus around the organisation, which is something we want to change with the best will in the world. Um, academic, unique, a volunteer, but outdated, rigid, obsessive, exclusive. I don't know whether this rings a bell with you. <laughs> we are also passionate, rigorous, respected and independent in terms of how people see us. So, you know, it's a, it's a good and bad picture, as you would expect. People generally, overwhelmingly, see Cochrane Reviews as the gold standard, something we talk about and they talk about too. You can see the reasons why. They're well known to you already. But the reviews are hampered by the failure to translate into the wider world. They see them as difficult to understand, as lacking actionable output, as inflexible, as etc., etc. You can read them. Um, Nikki touched on some of these aspects yesterday. Funders need evidence of impact to justify their expenditure and their, their support to us. Um, there, are, there are cuts to everything they said, so tell us how you are impactful to help us to evidence the support that we give you. So, how can we become more impactful? First, raise awareness of Cochrane. Publicize the assets in the theory and in practice. Secondly, increase the accessibility of our evidence. Our evidence needs to be both available and actionable. People have to know what to do with it. Part of the feedback that we got, you'll see some, some quotes in the wider um, slide deck show that people said there is a so what element at the end of, of, of coming to some of our reviews. We have to change that. We also, um, we also have to make sure that our, comp our communications are simplified and clear. The most powerful way of changing somebody's perception is through stories. We have to convert those numbers into stories. Um, apparently, um, uh, there was an example given by, by, um, uh, by some, somebody that, that the organization talked to to say, proudly, I speak Cochrane. 
well, that's great, except the rest of the world doesn't speak Cochrane. So we need to make sure that we don't communicate in Cochrane, because Cochranese um, has no validity outside rooms such as this. So we need to improve the usability of our evidence as well. It needs to be relevant, up to date, with clear implications. And we've been talking about that in the last 24 hours. The good news about all of that, and as I say, there's so much more that you can go and, and see, is that thankfully our strategy is doing the right thing. It's absolutely representative of what stakeholders want and the problems and the issues and the challenges that we see, that they, that they see we, we have to deal with. But we have varying levels of credibility in these areas. If you look at cur current reality and future aspiration in terms of where, where, where we are on our, our, our key four goals, um, you can see that um, quality and coverage, they, they see very strong. Relevant up to date, so-so. Pioneering methods and efficient production way over as much to be improved. A long way to go there. If we look at making our evidence accessible, you can see that we've gone some way to open access, but in terms of user-centered and accessible language, we're way over here with, with a lot to do. <coughs> in terms of advocating for evidence, um, yes, we're seen as a global partner. Yes, we're already beginning to see as, be seen as a home of evidence, but our global profile and global impact are regarded as relatively low-key. And finally, in relation to the kind of organisation we need to be, um, we are seen already as global and diverse, despite that UK heart, if you like, and we, we are seen as investing in people and transparently governed, but um, some way to go in terms of inclusive and open and financially strong and efficiently run, not so much. So in broad terms, this is where we play out in terms of what we, what, where we are and where we have to go. And as you can see, advocating for evidence and making our evidence accessible are the areas where we have most work to do. So back to brand. Strategy to 2020 commits us to invest in our profile and impact. Um, and we're planning to launch a new brand across all Cochrane content in January 2015. This new brand identity should first refresh the logo without losing its story and recognition. Secondly, strengthen the logo so it works effectively across all media, large and small. Third, rename the organization's Cochrane, something we agreed in our strategy last year. Fourth, develop consistent logo typography, the, the word Cochrane, that fits tonally every... every um, uh, um, Every font has a different story, and so we need to find one that we think best, best reflects who we are and, and what we are. We need to consider potentially colour development to signal our evolution beyond the, the blue that we, we know so well. And we need to create a brand framework which will allow the multiplicity of Cochrane groups around the world to use the master brand, but also to, to differentiate themselves in, uh, uh, in, in, with their own identity. So working with a design agency, we've developed four different concepts. At this stage, only covering logo, color palette, and typography. And as you may know, we've asked you to tell us what you think about that. Uh, think about them. For those who haven't seen them, what I'm just going to do is, is very, very quickly... Um, was it Control-L? Oh, can't remember, don't know. Okay, um, maybe this will, this will have to do. Uh, there was a full screen version, but I'll, uh, I'll, I'll do on that. So we have four options that I'm going to whiz through. Um, and it's really just to give you a flavor. If you haven't had a look, then I do urge you to go onto the Cochrane Community site and, and have a look in more detail and make a vote. We'd like your votes by April, uh, by the end of, of this month. And that will be our kind of first level um, uh, choices that we're making. So this is option one. Option one, of course, is a very, very minor change to our existing colour logo and look. It's the existing colour. It's a slightly stylized um, uh, forest plot look with a, uh, a type called clear sands. And forgive me, I'm going, to, I'm going to rush through, but this just gives you some idea of what the typeface might look like and how the branding might work through in terms of the differentiation of different uh, of different groups. As you can see, Cochrane in all four versions that you're going to see is made bold. So the differentiation is 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 Cochrane X, Cochrane Y. 
This is what it looks like small, which is very important. Increasingly, people are going to be looking at our stuff on these kind of devices, and, uh, and therefore it's got to work on a, on a scaled-down version as well as on reports and on big, um, uh, you know, big full-page uh, presentations on, on the web as well. That's option one, minimal change. Option two goes for um, the sea of Cochrane with the forest plot incorporated within it. Everything is changeable. So we've gone for green. It could be purple. It could be orange. It could be red. It could be anything we choose. Um, uh, that's, um, uh, that's all up for discussion. A different, slightly different typeface, this one called Source Sands. You'll see two versions of Source Sands uh, as it's a more elegant, um, still, still quite you know, heavy and forceful, but, but elegant type. This is what it looks like. And you can see that, um, you can see the difference, and you can also see the change and the difference in the way that, that colour does lift and do, does allow you to do more, more things in presentational terms if we choose to go the colour route. Option three gets rid of the, of the, of the Cs and instead um, has a clear lozenge using, again, source sands. This is the radical version, option four. Um, you can see that the forest, plot, um, the forest plot has been taken down to its stylistic uh, basic elements. Some of the methodologists have told me, of course, that the lozenge needs to be blue um, as opposed to, uh, to orange. That's what, that's what I'm told. Um, but we can make those adjustments as we go, as we go down the line. Of course, the color could be, uh, the color could be anything. The, um, the, the, the circle is lost. And instead, we've got this. Um, also, a, th a, third, a third typeface, Ubuntu, Ubuntu, which is, as you see, it's, um, it's more stylized, it's, it's heavier, it's more, it's more forceful. That's what it look, would look like on the sub-brands. And there we are. So, um, I wanted to give you, uh, give you a sense of what we've accomplished, what our goals are, uh, and where we're going. And um, the, the logo, this, this, this first part of, of this, is the first steps in establishing a brand. And a brand is far more than just a logo, just a name, and so on. It's about the story that we tell of who we are and, and, and what we do. And, and because that's actually a, a critically important thing for us to, to get right uh, in our future. Um, we thought it would be really interesting to, to, um, to ask um, a real branding expert, somebody who's very well known in the, in the branding world about what a brand is and means and could be and should be uh, for us. And therefore, I'm delighted to say that we've um, invited B.J. Cunningham, who is an, uh, 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 all of those things, a real global expert in relation to brand. And he's going to challenge us and, uh, and tell us a little bit more about what we should be thinking about and, and how we should be, um, be, be working through what brand and branding means to Cochrane in the coming years. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you for that kind introduction. Um, and also, thank you for, for inviting me here to, um, to share with you my thoughts and ideas. And rather than give you a lecture on what is brand and why does it matter, etc., what I wanted to do is, is um, bring out the relevant points by way of a story using a case study. And that case study is going to be based upon my own um, personal journey and the learnings I've had as a result of my numerous failures um, in my life, which I think are always more interesting than successes. Do you think you could um, set this up for me while I... And while that's happening, I'll give you a bit more of a flavour for who I am. I'm an entrepreneur. I've never had a job other than um, a job that I created. Um, my career started completely by accident. After university, I went travelling. I ended up in Los Angeles, and I used the last of my money to buy a beautiful old sports car, a Carmen Gear convertible. 
And when I brought it back to the UK, the guy at Felixstowe, who fills out all the paperwork at Customs, offered me double what I'd paid for the car. And so I sold it to him and then took the money and went back to Los Angeles and bought two cars. <laughs> Um, brought them back, doubled my money, went back again and bought four, and this continued over a two, three year period, and I, I moved from Carmen Gears up through Alfa Romeos and eventually Jaguars and Maseratis and Ferraris, and, and I just kept doubling my money. It was like going into a casino and knowing that every time you span the wheel, it was going to come up black, and every time it came up black, and I just kept doubling my money, and I ended up with a beautiful house in Knightsbridge and a gorgeous gorgeous girlfriend and, and a fantastic, <laughs> fantastic dog. And, 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 and I couldn't understand why my mates were complaining about their jobs, where for me it was just this easy ride. What I didn't understand about the market at the time that I was operating in, the classic sports car market, was that the whole market was an illusion. It was based upon a then capital gains loophole, whereby if you bought any vehicle that was over 20 years old and you sold it, you didn't have to pay capital gains on the money you made when you sold it. So everybody was piling in, thank you, piling into the classic sports car market, and the market was expanding and expanding, and, and I sat there happily on the edge of this bubble, truly believing that good value for a, for a Ferrari was 2.5 million quid, and thinking this thing would never end, and, and thinking, well, frankly, thinking that, that I was the bollocks, really, that, that nothing <laughs> could go wrong and that everything I touched was going to turn to gold. When the market collapsed, it collapsed abruptly, it collapsed overnight, the Chancellor changed the legislation, a Ferrari failed to reach its asking price at auction, and the whole market fell out of bed. And when this happened, I had eight containers of Ferraris up the Panama Canal, and the Panama Canal closed for political reasons, so I was up this really big creek with no paddle, and I lost everything. I lost everything. These things happen really slowly and then really, really fast. I lost, I lost the house. I lost the girlfriend. <laughs> I, I kept the dog. You know, you, you know where you stand with a good dog. And, um, and I ended up with a personal overdraft of £876,000. And I was 23 years old. And I did the only thing I could think of doing at the time, which was to call my father... <laughs> who is a, uh, who's a deeply lovely and generous man. He's a professional man. He's always been there for us as a family, um, always looked after us. You know. And I remember the conversation, Dad, I, I've got a problem. No problem, BJ, I'm sure we can help. You know, what's, the, what's the damage? And I said, well, Dad, it's 876,000. And there was this silence <laughs> on the phone. <laughs> and then he said, you're on your own. You know, <laughs> I'm sure you'll learn a valuable lesson. And, and, uh, and I did. <laughs> I learned my first proper business lesson or commercial lesson, which is this. If you owe the bank five grand, you're a bad debt. If you owe the bank 876,000, you're a good customer. And all of a sudden, I was a good customer with the bank, and the bank manager took me into a room I'd never seen before, and there was a, a Chesterfield sofa, and he served really nice coffee in China cups, and he started to talk about our problem and how are we going to solve this problem. And I, and I love that we. I suddenly realized I, I was in a position of some leverage, and... And I did a deal with the bank, which in short was this. If you'll lend me a further 250 and write my current debt down to 250, I'll pay you back the 500,000 over a three-year period based on the following business plan. And God bless them. At this stage, I've just got to say, God bless Barclays Bank. Because okay? <laughs> without them doing that deal then, I would not be here now telling you this tale. And that, that taught me another lesson, which is it's easy to do things and make things happen when times are easy and money's flowing and everything's good. It's when times are tough and you're in a corner and things are difficult, that's when real relationships are built. And it's those real relationships that see you through those hard times, as well as the good times that are bound to follow. Barclays put me through that situation. And I've never forgot them. I've stuck with them ever since. I've, I've made them their money back many, many times over. But nonetheless, that allowed me to get going into my next adventure, which I'm going to come back and talk to you about as a case study. And after seven years, that culminated in me becoming an expert in provocative brand marketing and brand creation. I realize you don't have to do much to be an expert. You just have to do something, and then you're an expert. And I decided to leverage this newfound position of expertise and start an advertising agency. Took out 3,500 square foot of space in Old Street in London. Hired my cousin, who was unemployed at the time, and, and pretty soon realized I needed clients. And the way you get clients as an advertising agency is by being a genuine expert. And the way you become a bona fide expert is by writing a book. And so I wrote a book, and I bought 5,000 copies of the book to send out to the CEOs and the marketing directors of the companies I wanted to be my clients. And as a result of buying 5,000 copies, 
the book became an international business bestseller. <laughs> and then I, was, <laughs> then I was invited to talk about these newfound ideas around brand and brand marketing. And, and incidentally, I don't recommend the book. Um, it, wasn't, it, <laughs> it wasn't a good book. Uh, no one read the book. I, in fact, I know no one read it. On page 168, I laced into the text, blah, 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 blah. And if you've got this far, you've done really well. Give me a call and I'll send you a bottle of whiskey. Because I thought that would generate inbound calls. And no one called. So, <laughs> so, so I know no one read it. But there was one idea in that book which is worth iterating, worth reminding you of, particularly at this important time in your story. And that idea is not my idea. It's based upon uh, a, a, a Buddhist philosophy that goes back 3,000 years, the principle of Dharma, which is right thought, right word, right action. The idea being, know what it is you're trying to say, say it clearly, and then do what you said you were going to do when you said you were going to do it. Now, if you can live by those three rules, you will have a successful, happy life. If you can work in your business by those three rules, you will have a successful brand. Know what it is you're trying to say with your brand. Say it clearly, and then do what you said you were going to do when you said you were going to do it. Because a brand is not a logo. What you saw up here were three, four different logo iterations. All of them are valid. All of them are good. I've made logos for people during my time that have cost hundreds of thousands of pounds. And the guy I've sold the logo to thinks he's got a brand. He hasn't. He's got a really expensive bit of artwork. It only becomes a brand when it becomes synonymous with the intention of the organization in the mind of the customer. A brand is not a logo. It is not a name. A brand is a promise. It is your promise that matters, not your logo. Your logo is just a vehicle for carrying that promise consistently into the mind of your customer. It's what your customer believes of you to be true that matters. And the bottleneck to the market is the eyes and the ears. And getting behind the eyes and between the ears of the customer requires either a compelling, relevant idea or promise that I'm interested in, or a shed load of cash that you can carpet bomb people's consciousness with. The former route is the better. The logo is just a vehicle for carrying the promise forward. It's your promise that matters. So the agency went on as a result of this book. We grew, um, our client base included Volkswagen, Bang & Olufsen, Nokia, plethora of different clients. I sold the agency in August 2001, which was very, very fortuitous because then September the 11th happened. The whole market fell out of bed. I was all wedged up. And I then invested in my wife, who's actually genuinely talented, as opposed to being a uh, gifted scammer. And, uh, <laughs> and she, she's a shoe designer. She designs all the shoes for Cassidy, Polini, um, Alexander McQueen, plethora of very high-end uh, fashion brands, as well as her own brand. Grew that business. And in the meantime, continue with consultancy, working with major international companies, helping them out of senior board level, essentially with truth finding and digging down into what is their core promise, what is their intention, and how can we manifest that clearly in the mind of the customer. This is one of the key learnings to bear in mind. You do not control your brand. Mark doesn't control the brand as CEO. The brand exists and is controlled by your customer. What they believe of you to be true is true until you change it. And you have to change it by giving them evidence with which to change it. So essentially, the work and practice of Cochrane in terms of what you actually do is exactly the same in terms of the way you go about clarifying and expressing your brand. Clarifying and expressing your brand is the most important journey, in my view, because people are interested in ideas. They are loyal to promises. Not products, not price points. This is a competition of ideas and promises, not products and not price points. I've called this presentation Profiting from the Truth. That will become apparent as we go through it. I've also subtitled it Simple is Beautiful. There's a truly excellent book I recommend everybody here read if you haven't read it already, written by an economist in the late 60s called Schumacher. His book is Small is Beautiful. It is a beautiful, beautiful book. And the ideas in that book are as relevant today as they were back then. Essentially, there are three big ideas in that book. The first, and they puncture, three big illusions. And it's worth just iterating those illusions. The first illusion is, there is not enough. There's not enough. Well, there is enough 
if we're willing to work together, to collaborate, to move forward in a common direction in order to achieve our common goals. There is enough. The second illusion is that more is better. Well, I can assure you, more is not better. It's just more. And once you've got more, there's always more, and then there's always more, and then there's always more. More is not better, it's just more. The third, most compelling, most dangerous illusion of all is this. That's just the way it is. That's just the way it is. Well, that is not just the way it is. Everything in my life has taught me. We are the authors of our own creation. We are the writer, the producer, the director, the lead actor in our own movie. So the learning from that is this. If in your life, in your business, you see beauty, it's your beauty. And if you see horror, it's your horror. So own it. Own the all of it. And if you're not happy with it, rewrite it. Turn it into the story you believe in and the story you want to tell. Right thought, right word, right action. Simple is beautiful is another take on that, on that idea. In my life, I've noticed that anything literally more complicated than being able to write on the back of an envelope or express in five seconds as you go up an elevator with somebody is either not going to work or it's going to cost shed loads of cash. So keeping things simple is a really, really important principle on which to move forward, particularly when it comes to storytelling and when it comes to branding. Because after all, that's what it is. It's about putting your idea, your promise, into the mind of your customer and putting it in there as efficiently and as effectively as possible. There's another um, mantra that's guided me on my journey, and it's this. Wherever there's a hidden agenda or an outright lie, there's the potential for profit. Okay, now, again, that is not a new idea. The American Indian said, the antidote is in the venom. Frank Lloyd Wright said, a building should be of the hill, not on the hill. I say, wherever there's a nightmare, a problem we just don't want to face, at the heart of that problem is a solution bursting to come out. So a really good way of looking at life is, if in your life, or in your business, or in your practice, you've got loads of problems, you are truly blessed. <laughs> because the universe is kissing you with those problems and giving you numerous opportunities to change. A problem is an opportunity to change. If we're brave enough, courageous enough, to stare that demon in the eye, name it for what it is, learn the lessons from it, which are always painful, and take those lessons in order to move on to be the next grandest version of the greatest vision we ever held about who we really are. Problems are opportunities, opportunities for change. Now, this story, this case study, this idea, this journey is going to sound like a Cinderella story. It's going to sound like a fairy tale. I want you to know it's all true. None of the names and numbers have been changed. And it's, it's, it's in an industry I'm sure many of you are not familiar with. So I want to just lay out the industry very, very quickly. It's the tobacco industry. And I want to just summarize the tobacco industry for you in a nutshell. The tobacco industry is a volume game where the government make all the money. 86% of the selling price on a packet of cigarettes is tax. In my view, the guy who's taking 86% of the revenue is the guy who's selling the product. Tobacco companies are just glamorous tax collectors. It is the government that sells cigarettes. Okay, that is a very simple way of looking at this now 24 billion pound industry called the tobacco industry. And that whole industry revolves around one key issue. And that issue you're all very familiar with, which is health. And that one little word, health, presents a very big problem for the poor old seller, for the government. Because on the one hand, you've got the health of the nation in terms of the damage and the disease caused from tobacco consumption, versus on the other hand, the health of the exchequer in terms of all of the revenues generated as a result of tobacco taxation. So on the one hand, they're damaging all these people, but they're making all this money. You know, it's a terrible moral dilemma for the poor old state. And this is the fulcrum of that debate. Cigarettes are the only legally available consumer product that kill people when used exactly as intended. God, that's my phone. I should have, I should have, uh, that'll probably be my mum. <laughs> so, oh. I always say to people, you know, turn off your phone. And so this is, the, this is the nub of it. This is the fulcrum. This is the problem. Cigarettes 
kill people when used exactly as intended. You can imagine now, it's the late 60s, early 70s, this slide comes up, you're on the board of Gallagher or Imperial or Philip Morris or RJ Reynolds, it's an import, you're in a big tobacco company, this slide comes up. This is a massive problem. But rather than embrace that problem, the tobacco industry collectively decided to retreat from the issue. In retreating from the issue, they stuck their head in the sand, uttering only two words, no comment. As a result of sticking their head in the sand, they had their arse in the air, and they took a fierce kicking from the emergence of a new group of liberty snatchers, these, these pink-lunged, aubergine-eating curtain twitchers who are out there desperately telling everybody what they should or shouldn't be doing, the anti-smoking lobby. So as a direct consequence of the tobacco industry failing to live up to its own problem, it set up a soapbox for the anti-smoking lobby to stand on and preach. Now, you'll probably hear from this, I, I have very little respect for the anti-smoking lobby. The anti-smoking lobby have one agenda, and their agenda is prohibition. Whenever you hear this word ban, what it means is remove our rights as adults in a free society to make our own decisions and defer those rights to some abstract state that supposedly knows better than us what's good for us. I, I have very little respect for prohibition as an idea. Prohibition is a last century idea that failed and failed horribly. It's illogical to legislate against someone's appetite. If you want something, you'll get it. It doesn't matter whether it's legal or illegal. All that prohibition does is, is sweep problems under legislative carpets. The problems don't go away. They stay there, they rot, they stink. Eventually, they rot their way through the very fabric of our society. Then they cause real problems. So I'm a gentle libertarian. I, I believe in freedom of choice. I believe in furnishing people with the information with which to make a decision and then honoring the decision that they make as adults in a free society, not telling them what they should or shouldn't be doing. Because in my view, prohibition leads to one thing and one thing only, and that is Al Capone. Okay? And as I say, I would rather satisfy my, my appetite in a, in a store than down some dark alley with a gangster. Okay, so, so very straightforward, gentle, free market view of the world. Smoking, then, has become this polemic issue. On the one hand, you've got these fundamentalist Puritans waving their fingers, telling everybody what they should or shouldn't be doing. On the other hand, you've got these heroes who even in a, in a hurricane with the rain coming sideways will be, <laughs> will be outside smoking their cigarette. And then you've got most people, 98% of people, don't really care much either way. You know, if, don't tell me what I should or shouldn't be doing. You know, if you want to smoke and kill yourself, go ahead. People in a grey... <laughs> the beautiful thing about any fundamentalist in any argument is how easy it is to wind them up. I was on a live TV debate show with the head of Ash, which is the anti-smoking lobby in the UK, and this bloke was furious with me, just for breathing, and he had a, he had a, he had a <laughs> red face and a bit of gob on his lip. Mr. Kelly, Mr. Kelly, what about passive smoking? What about passive... I said, well, in my opinion, passive smokers should buy their own and pay their tax like everyone else. I don't, I don't understand why they're getting away from it. He, was, he got up and he left. You know, well, there's a lesson. Never leave a live TV debate show. You know, you will look like an idiot. In, in his case, he, he was. But in any event, you've, you've got this debate. There's this big polemic, this big stretch. And in all of that, I saw a commercial opportunity, an opportunity for a new brand with a unique promise, the truth. Now, you'll notice here, I've put the truth in inverted commas, because as you all know, there is no singular truth. The truth resides in faith. What we believe to be true is true for us. It doesn't necessarily mean it's true for everybody else. In fact, in fact a little bit more respect for each other's truth, this world would be a healthier, happier, less dangerous, less fearful place. The truth resides in faith. What we believe to be true is true. Perception is everything. And that is a very important marketing business insight. Because as I said, the facts matter. Your peer reviews matter. Your distribution matters. The price per uh, review matters. You, the, everything, it all matters. But what matters most is what people believe of you to be true. Belief is everything. Uh, incidentally, none of this is new. Branding, marketing, this is all thousands of years old. It's about influencing and engendering belief in the mind of the customer. I'll give you an example by way of a story. An angel 
impregnates a virgin, who gives birth to the Son of God, who grows up to die on a cross to save us from our sins, then rises from the dead to sit at the right hand of God the Father and will come again in glory to judge us all. Now, in my view, that's a long shot. You know, if that, if that, was, if that, was, if that was a business plan, I wouldn't invest. You know, that, that is a big ask. Okay, but, 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 but I would be wrong not to invest. Because 30% of the world's population would lay down their life and die for that belief. And there is a fantastic example of branding. Great logo. They've got, they've got retail outlets all over the world. You know, they've got a book. It's very important if you, if you want something to believe something, put it in a book, buy it yourself, give it away free. You know, none of this. None of this is new. None of it. It's about belief. Belief is everything. Well, my view is, okay, there's a simple promise that I can make that most people, be they a smoker or a non-smoker, would believe, and that's, that is this. Smoking kills. There's a very simple story. You know, I would challenge you to find anybody who didn't hold that to be true. My view was fine. Okay, smoking kills. As an adult in a free society where smoking is legal, if you choose to smoke, it's your funeral. Too bad you're going to die. Okay, very, sm very simple. Smoking kills. You're an adult. There's the information. You still want to smoke. It's your responsibility. It's your funeral. Too bad you're going to die. So I created a brand of cigarettes called Death <laughs> with the universal symbol of poison and disease, the skull and crossbones as the logo. Of course, we also had slow death. You know, it's very important to have choice in these matters. And, <laughs> and uh, we couldn't get the Queen's warrant, so we created our own um, warrant at the top, which was a skull and crossbones on top of a burning funeral pyre where the flames look vaguely like a lion and a unicorn. And, and underneath is a scroll, and in the scroll it says, our cause is just, we must prevail. And I was so excited by this idea. And again, I've got to say, God bless Barclays Bank, okay, because this is the idea I went to them with. And one of the caveats they had was, BJ, will back you as long as you can find somebody to manufacture it for you. I thought that would be a no-brainer. And then I had the shortest business meeting in my entire life when I went to see the new brand development director at Gallagher, one of the largest tobacco companies in the UK. And I went in and I put my mock-up pack on his desk. Desk cigarettes, they're, they're the truth. They're, they're so cool. Blah, blah. He just picked up the phone. Security! And then they, <laughs> they physically threw me to the ground outside their office. And then it took me six months. I just want to stress how long six months is when you're 876 grand overdrawn. It's an eternity, because every month you're going down another 15 grand on interest. And, and there's a lesson. Be careful what you wish for. Because if you are dogged and you are willing to go down the road of trials that you set up for yourself, the universe will wash you up on the beach of your choosing. She will slam you onto that beach. And that beach will be worth exploring. You know, we, be careful what you wish for. After six months, I ended up in Amsterdam in a cafe um, enjoying a cappuccino, uh, <laughs> sitting, <laughs> sitting opposite this lovely bloke, and we were having such a laugh, and after about two hours, the conversation came around to what do you do, and it transpired, he had just inherited his cigarette factory from his father, <laughs> and at the same time, he'd found religion, and he was having a hard time rec reconciling these newfound religious beliefs with the manufacture of cigarettes, so I offered him the opportunity to profit from the truth with death cigarettes, and he said amen, and the next thing, <laughs> I had my one-bedroom flat in Lewisham, because I'd now moved from Knightsbridge down to Lewisham, and I'm sorry if anyone here is from Lewisham, but it's the arse end of London. And I was in this one-bedroom flat and thought I'd made it. But in fact, it was the beginning of a vertical learning curve. A vertical learning curve in terms of distribution, taxation, in terms of everything. Fundamentally, it was a journey of brand in becoming synonymous with the truth in the mind of the customer. We wanted to own the truth. We wanted to become the honest fag, the honest cigarette. So on top of all of the statutory advice that you have to put on cigarette packaging. We had our own manufacturer's advice. Cigarettes are addictive and debilitating. If you don't smoke, don't start. We pledged to donate 10% of our pre-tax profits to non vivisection cancer research and related charities. Now, the reason we did that wasn't altruism. It wasn't a guilt trip. It wasn't CSR. It was, it was very straightforward. Smokers need the cancer research. Cancer research needs the money. We needed the smokers. So it created a win-win <laughs> scenario and, and I'm a great believer, if you know yourself to be part of a problem, it's your responsibility to become part of the solution. And invite your customer to become part of that solution. Use your customer. Bring your customer in. Make them part of your organization, not apart from it. So we were all about juxtapositioning. So against the no comment from the traditional tobacco industry, we sang a eulogy to cigarettes. 
because I love fags. I smoke since I was 13. I love putting a cigarette in my mouth and lighting it and inhaling and feeling the warm air go into my lungs and the nicotine rip into my bloodstream, knowing I'm going to have another in 10 minutes. I love fags. They deliver every time. But the problem is, you're going to die, and you're going to die horribly. And if you're cool with that, you're a smoker. And if you're smoking and you're not cool with that, well, think carefully about what it is that you're doing. So against the no proof that smoking damages health, we said very straightforwardly, no, smoking kills. In fact, we offered a money-back guarantee on exactly <laughs> that point. Against their sophisticated brand names, Benson and Hedges, Marlboro, we called ours death. While they were trying to camouflage the health warning, we were actively becoming the health warning. So while they were offering cowboys in colours, we were offering the universal symbol of poison and disease in a black and white pack with a black and white message. We were saying cigarette smoking is not like hanging around in the Grand Canyon rounding up cattle. It is not like having a moustache driving a jeep through the jungle fighting crocodiles. It's not like being a jet fighter pilot or a Formula One racing car driver. Cigarette smoking is simple. You'll have a sublime hit of gorgeous nicotine through your radically shortened life. <laughs> and then you will die, and you will die horribly. And as I say, if you're cool with that, you're a smoker. And if you're not, think again. So we had certain values to our brand. Responsibility, logic, honesty, freedom. Fundamentally, what we were talking about was freedom of choice. Because as I said earlier, you can only ever make a decision if you're furnished with the information with which to make the decision. If you're not furnished with that information, you're not making a decision, you're taking a guess. The critical information you need in regard to smoking is, you're going to die. Given that information, it's your funeral. So we were responsible on the back of every packet we wrote. Smoking does not make you sexy, stylish, or sophisticated. It kills you. We're not selling a pack of lies. We are selling a pack of cigarettes. In terms of choice, we said just say no instead of just say no. Education and not legislation. Furnish people with the information and then honour the decision that they make as adults in a free society. Don't tell them what they should or shouldn't be doing. And we reinforced all of this with our sponsorship activity in order to get this brand message out into the minds of customers. So, for example, we sponsored the, the life-saving heart bypass operation of a guy from Hull who was being refused treatment by the National Health Service because he was a smoker. Which, in my view, is an outrage because he paid a premium for that service through all the taxes he'd been paying on his fags. We brought him under blue light to London. He had a quadruple heart bypass. He survived. The next day, there was a big press conference, about as many people as there are here. You could feel the journalists were angry. There was this tension in the air that someone should be so audacious. And the first question came from the Daily Mirror. Mr. Cunningham, are you not just cynically exploiting this man's life in order to promote your brand of cigarettes? And the answer was, yes. You know, that, that is exactly what we're doing. You know, don't, don't you think it'd be more cynical to let this guy die? And then the next day, death saves life, Dr. Death in Life Saving. We had fantastic coverage, and we saved a guy's life. It was a fantastic piece of marketing. Another example, we sponsored the Gay Pride Festival in London as the Honest Fag, because Gay Pride is all about being an honest fag, and we were all about selling honest fags, and we brought Pink Death out, and I got snogged by Lily Savage, who's a great kisser. You know, it was a fantastic event. And fundamentally, it's exactly the same issue. Whose business is it how two adults in our society choose to love each other? It is nobody else's business but their own. We ought to spend a lot more time taking the plank out of our own eye rather than looking at the speck in everybody else. Mind your own business is a fantastic mantra. We've got enough problems of our own rather than worrying about anybody else's problems. Let people get on with their own lives. In terms of advertising, we never had enough money to advertise. We only took out poster sites outside the offices of the major newspapers because we were targeting journalists. Journalists were the gatekeeper to the market. We wanted to get into the market through the hand of the journalist. We wrote these ads. They're every bit as good as other cigarettes and every bit as bad. 13 and a half million smokers will, it's met, will admit it's bad for them. Only one tobacco company will. And where we could advertise in the press, we again advertised to the journalist, but with copy ads explaining our story as opposed to image ads trying to promote awareness. I would say this. It's not about awareness. It's about involvement. It doesn't matter if my grandmother's heard of Nike. She's never going to buy a pair of trainers. Okay, what matters is being synonymous with something in the mind of your customer. It's important to know who you are for as well as who you're not for. 
So in, so in terms of all of this then, we had evangelical smokers. We had people who loved the death cigarettes idea. But the problem was we had no distribution. The reason we had no distribution was because the major tobacco companies didn't want to see a cigarette called death on the shelf next to their product. And they own the shelf. Everywhere you go and see cigarettes for sale, it's owned by a major tobacco company. We tried everything. We tried our own vending machines. We had them in the form of coffins. They were called death traps. We, we tried everything. But every time our reps went and put the cigarettes up, their army of reps came and took the cigarettes down. And at this stage, I had three factories on the Dutch-German border, 207 employees. But we were looking at a six-month burn before we went out of business. So I had to find a way of getting around this distribution problem because there was a very simple lesson I learned. It doesn't matter how much people want your product, if it's not on the shelf for sale, they can't buy it. Okay, I know, I know it sounds obvious. It took me a, a really long time to work that out. But in any event, I had to find a, problem to, a solution to this distribution problem. And at about this time, I heard about a, a guy from Newcastle upon Tyne who had been, um, who, a guy from Newcastle upon Tyne who had imported seven and a half tons of alcohol into the UK and claimed it was for his personal consumption. <laughs> and as a result, UK tax and duty wasn't payable because he'd already paid it once in France. So I started looking at European law. I started studying the tax differentials between member states. And I came up with a scheme for a tax arbitrage scheme, which I put to my then board with one simple slide. Guys, I've got an idea. I want to call it Tobacco Direct, whereby we can make a 40% discount on price while we, while we make a 25% net margin being paid in advance with no bad debt. Now, my board were naturally interested. You know, they wanted to know what the idea was. And so I explained. I knew that a principle of Roman law that underpins UK and European law is que facit per alium facit per se. Now, what that bit of Latin means is if you appoint somebody to act as your agent, in the eyes of the law, they are you. So you can't get round the law by way of a third party. If you say to somebody, go and rob a bank, and that person goes and robs a bank, it's as if you were robbing the bank yourself because they're acting as your agent. So I said, what would happen if I set up a company to act as agent for UK smokers, purchasing cigarettes on their behalf in another member state of Europe, then again, as their agent arranged for the transport of those cigarettes via DHL to their home address in the UK for their personal consumption? Where would the tax be payable? 70,000 pounds later, senior tax counsel in the UK tells me the tax will be payable at the point of purchase for consumption, which I chose to be Luxembourg because that's where the European Court of Justice is and I knew that's where we'd end up. So we kicked off this scheme <laughs> and we called it the Grim Reaper Don't Come Cheaper. And, <laughs> and, and we started. And over a six-month period, the mail we were receiving was increasing day by day. We were getting six or seven sacks of mail in each was an envelope which either had 80 or 800 quid. People either tested the water with a minimum or filled their boots with a, ma with a maximum. We became DHL's largest customer in Europe, flying two aircraft full of cigarettes into Stansted every week. I soon realized if you could do it with death cigarettes, you could do it with any brand of cigarettes. We did it with every brand of cigarettes. We sold Benelux out of Benson & Hedges, Silk Cup, Marlboro, Marlboro. It was such a laugh and the whole thing was changed. And then after six months, there was a knock on the door and it was Her Majesty's Customs and Excise. And I said, boys, come in, you're late. And they all came in, <laughs> and they sat around the boardroom table, and I gave them all a cigarette, because they all smoke, and we were having a cup of tea, and eventually, Mr. Cunningham, we'd better get down to business. Are there any cigarettes on this premises which have not had UK tax and duty paid? I said, yes, you're all smoking them. And they all put out their fags, and, and then they took everything. And I said, you're acting illegally. I'm a good European citizen. They said, you're nothing more than a common bootlegger. I was thrilled. This gave rise to a judicial review in the UK. And the reason all of this was happening was because we were basically threatening a then 14.5 billion pound revenue stream to the Exchequer. We were essentially putting a government in a position where it had to tax compete in exactly the same way that everybody else has to price compete. So we were looking at all of this. We went to judicial review. The judicial review judge referred it on to the, House, to the, uh, to the appeal court. The appeal court referred it on to the House of Lords. The, the House of Lords then referred it on to the European Court of Justice where Her Majesty's Customs and Excise were joined by every other member state of Europe apart from Spain and Portugal who were on my team. So it was me, Spain and Portugal against every other member state. And the European Court's beautiful. It's, it's a horseshoe shaped business building, all wood. There's glass at the top and it's auditorium style and you sit on these seats with a little knob and you can hear it simultaneously translated in Greek or German or whatever you fancy and, and sat there. And in the European Court, you don't have one or three judges. You have 10 judges. They all wear pink. They've got these long pink silk robes. And the lead judge in our case was a French judge. And he stood up and he gave his ruling. And his ruling was no. 
And then he gave his reasoning, and I quote, it cost me 1.6 million to hear this. Mr. Cunningham, you are right in law, but the law was never intended for you to be right, and therefore you are wrong. Okay, I, I promise you, that is what the guy said. And I was furious, and in the European court, you come out and there's a gully and TV cameras, and Mr. Cunningham and CNN, and what do you make of this ruling? And it's just beep, beep, and beep, beep, beep. And, and my mum was listening, and BJ, you can't talk like that on television. And mum, you don't understand, even 1.6 million. And so for me, it was, it was basically a new product. I was now obsessed with tax. I started looking at how cigarettes are taxed. Cigarettes are taxed in two ways. One is an ad valorem tax. That's a percentage of the recommended retail price. Nothing you can do. You set your price as the manufacturer. That's it. You pay a percentage in tax. The other tax is a specific tax. That is a tax per specific cigarette stick. So I looked at what is the legal definition of a cigarette stick. Cigarettes are defined under European Directive number 32, dated 1979, as cut tobacco, rolled in paper, capable for immediate use for smoking, not exceeding nine centimeters in total length of tobacco roll, excluding filter or mouthpiece. In other words, you can't have one enormous fag, okay? Because every nine centimeters, you're going to be taxed like it's another. But what it doesn't say is where the filter has to be. So I put the filter in the middle, perforated it. That way, you could break it in half. You got two fags for the price of one. I called them two for one. I patented the machines. I had the whole thing set up with Booker and Palmer and Harvey. We were ready to roll. And then I got a call through from Bobby Henderson. Sir Robert Henderson, who is the principal of Her Majesty's Customs and Excise Division A, based up in Salford here in Manchester, who are all oh, cunning and Scottish, go, oh, cunning, and why don't you just get a job? And I said, I said, Bobby, this is my job. He said, no, these two for one, we can't have them. I said, I'm sorry, they're coming, and so we were back in court. The court case this time was very straightforward. What is a half plus a half? I knew I'd lose, because I'd been through the whole story before, so <laughs> I represented myself. Um, in my defense, I had an apple, a tray, and a knife. When it came to my turn, I said to the judge, how many apples do I have on my tray? And the judge said, you have one apple. I then took the knife and I cut the apple in half. I said, now how many apples do I have on my tray? And the judge said, I will not have this theatrics in my courtroom again. <laughs> he threw me out. And you won't be surprised that for tax purposes in the UK in regard to tobacco products, the ruling was a half plus a half equals two. <laughs> okay, so everything, everything in terms of brand, in terms of life, in terms of business, Everything is subject to radical and immediate change. Everything's going to change. So prepare your organization for the inevitable change. Be ready, be flexible, be willing. Embrace it, because that is the future. It's the only constant that we can be sure of. So for me, then, it was back to the drawing board. How do I encourage distribution? Increase the margin to the retailer. How do you increase the margin? Increase the price to the consumer. How do you justify the increase in price? Add content. The content I added was Gurana. In this way, I was able to do the opposite of the tobacco business. The tobacco business is high volume, low margin. This is high margin, low volume. Started to go really well. At about this stage, my Russian distributor, which is a really polite way of describing him, he's a, uh, he's a gangster, said, uh, Mr. BJ, I like your cigarettes. Have you got anything better? And I said, well, what do you mean by better? He said, more expensive. I said, yes, guys, I went back to the factory, guys, we've got to come up with something really expensive for the Russian. We did, we came up with the world's most expensive cigarettes. We called them Treasurer in honor of Robert Henderson. We, had, we made them 20 quid a pack. It started to go really well. We then launched them in the Far East. And then I learned after six months that BAT were going to launch a competitor product in the new super premium category that we would created. I was very nervous because this is BAT. They were going to wipe us out. And then I was delighted because they launched their product they called their product Equinox, very similar shape, packaging, blue instead of silver. And they launched it at £18.95 a packet, which is truly mad. I mean, who's going to buy the world's second most expensive? You know, they, they missed the point. They should have gone for 23 quid. This is not a product. This is a market position. Most expensive. They should have gone for most expensive. As a result, we were able to launch the most expensive cigars and accessories. That is the world's most expensive ashtray. Solid platinum, 36,000 quid. We didn't sell one of those ashtrays, but, <laughs> but we got a lot of press off the back of it. So there are a couple of things I want to close up with and confirm. I want to confirm that there is always life after death. Okay, 10 years ago when I was doing death cigarettes, when I learned those lessons, I could not imagine I would now be selling really expensive shoes that no one needs and very few people can afford. You know, I just can't, couldn't imagine it. There is always life after death. So the answer is be not afraid. Try something. 
Consumers will forgive you if you try something and fail. What they will not forgive is entropy. The big questions for your brand are exactly the same as the big questions for your life. What's your point and why should I care? Those are the only questions that need to be answered. What's your point and why should I care? And the answer needs to be the highest expression of who you really are or choose to be, because that is your brand. Your brand is the signpost through which people can follow you. Make that sign clear. And that demands love. It demands that you love what you do, that you love where you do it, that you love who you do it for, and most importantly, that you love who you do it with and who you do it for. Who you do it with, remove the illusion of separation. The illusion of separation says, you are separate to me. You are not separate. We are different. Honor the difference, not the separation. Include people in your organization. Welcome them in, love them. And if you don't, it's your responsibility to try harder to love them. And if you still don't, then try and change it so that you do. And if you still don't, and you've tried harder, and you still don't love it, then leave. You know, do something else. Life is short, and life is long. Love is the answer. Loving the customer is the most important message. All of your peer reviews matter, but only because there's an end result in terms of better health for somebody at the end of the day. Love your customer. Use your customer. Embrace your customer. Trust your customer. Know and understand your customer. That means presenting things in a way that they can understand. That means including them in your thinking and logic and in your story. That means embracing them. And this whole process that I've outlined here is completely symmetrical. By knowing and understanding, you trust. In trust, you come to love. By loving, you embrace. In embracing, you're making use of. By making use of, you are being helped by. And in being helped by, you can be truly grateful. Be grateful to your customer for being there. Treat your customer as you would have your customer treat you. And there's only one way in which any of us here would want to be treated, and that is in love. So the key message, in terms of everything I've told you, is brands are promises, and love is the answer. What is love? Love is the absence of fear. What is fear? The absence of love. Be in love. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you. DJ, thanks very much. I, I, I don't think we're going to have time for particular questions now, but will you be around for a few minutes if, if people want to wander up and speak? To you? Before people start to go, could I just ask, say to you, the reason you've got these fluorescent bits of paper on your desk, they're for feedback. Please write down on the, a bit of feedback about what you feel about what we've done, what we've organized for you, the speak, speakers, what you'd like it to happen next time, and then we've got a board outside you can stick them all on. I've been also asked to remind you that Hyderabad is in September, and I hope many of you are thinking of, of going to that. I would really like to ask you to join me in thanking the staff at the UK Cochrane Centre for Organising. I've done nothing to organise it. It really is the case that you know, I did very little, but my four members of staff over here have done everything, five members including Carly, so thank you very much. So please just write away for a bit, uh, put the notices outside, have a safe journey home, see you in Hyderabad, and if BJ's provo provoked you to a point where you're incandescent for <laughs> any reason, he's right here. Thanks very much. <laughs>